So now we're going to get all the source files, all the source packages that we need to start building Linux from scratch. So first of all, we're going to create a directory to put them in. And let's move into that directory as well by using command CD. There goes nothing in there. If I do a listing of the parent directory, so you can see we've got the boot directory and we've now got this new sources directory we've just created. Now we do a change mode command on that sources directory um, and it's to make it sticky which what it what it says is if, if multiple users have write permission on directory only the owner of that file can delete it within a st sticky directory in fact I should change back into that sources directory because it might not pick up that change we've just done so I'll just do that command again so the next thing we're going to do is to fetch the packages and conveniently the Linux from scratch people have um, created a list of all the packages and all the locations so all we need to do is to uh, run a command to fetch them or we don't have to get them by hand which is something we used to have to do so what we do if we right click this link and do copy link location you'll notice we will have we have now got a wget that works because we're inside this troop environment so let's fetch that list okay so the networking is not working so right ah, oh, now there's a little problem here didn't encounter or didn't envisage this we'll have to load this outside of the Linux from scratch because there's no networking set up within this uh, sorry within this gen 2 truth so let's get a new tab up become the root and as I said before, we haven't got a wget, so what we'll have to do is we'll have to fetch it. So I'm going to chance my luck as what the command will be to install the wget. Right, yes, it's working, luckily. So to get the wget for this Debian or Debian Live CD, I've done the command apt space install space wget. And we'll do yes to install that hopefully that's all that we'll need yeah that is so now what we need to do is we need to go into the MNT gen 2 directory because that's where our root is and you can see there's our system that we've been using which has been the root we now need to go into this MNT LFS directory and you can see there's our boot and our sources directory and finally we need to go to the sources directory which is at the moment empty we can now run wget and the link from this copy link location paste that in and that should now work yes it has so if we list that uh, yeah there's the wget list so we can now run this command here the only thing is the directory prefix, because uh, we're outside of the Gen 2 state tree environment, it knows nothing about LFS. Um, it doesn't actually exist at the moment. So there's two ways of doing this. We can either do the command and put the prefix as the current directory because that's where we are, or we could create an LFS directory with the directory being this path instead. Uh, sorry, this path. So what I might do is that. So we do export LFS. Um, just to prove that the LFS doesn't exist, if I do echo LFS, because we're in a different environment, the true is a completely different environment to the one that we've booted in. It's like a child environment. So that's why we can't see the LFS has been set there. So we'll set a new one and it's different anyway because we're outside of this MNT LFS location 
we had need to specify the MNT Gen 2 MNT LFS location. So export LFS equals that location. We should be able to echo it and it does. And this now means we can copy all of this command in and it will work correctly and put all the packages into the sources directory. And we can, while that's downloading, if I go here and do ls minus l, you can see there's all the packages that are starting to appear. You can see the bin utils one is only 100 or 1.8 megabytes here and it's gone to 21 megabytes, so it's downloading as we speak. So I'll just wait for that to finish downloading and we can carry on when that's done. Okay, so that's all downloaded. Now, um, next thing we need to do is to validate that those downloads have been downloaded successfully. This will not only check that all the packages have downloaded, um, it will also check they're complete and there's no corruption in the downloads as well. So, what we need to do is download this other list, which has got a list of all the checksums, the MD5 checksums for the um, each each package that we've downloaded, each source package. So again, we'll copy that link location, and in here we'll type wget space and just paste that link in with the center click on the mouse. Okay, and then we can run this command here to what this push D does. It just saves the directory, it is like a little memory, it makes a note of it, um, the current directory and then changes to the directory while we're actually in there so it, it's not made any difference and this command will actually do the validation of all, all the um, all the packages 
and looks like I can see there's no errors there at all so I'll just scroll back up yeah generally if there's been a problem it will report that at the end so that's all okay uh, this pop d command will return us to the directory we were at before which of course was no different to the one we changed to so there's nothing there to change so now we can go back to our true environment now we've got all the packages let's just list them to make sure uh, they are there's the list of the location so that list has got all the urls if you accidentally delete one of these packages which i have done before there's a good chance i might accidentally delete it again it's worth keeping that so you can get the download location to re-download it um, yeah there's the file with the checksums in and all the other files with a few patches as well so all the red files are archive files and the green ones are patch files which make uh, modifications either bug fixes or just slightly change the behavior of the uh, code uh, for what it's compiled so this is a list a page of a list of all the files and locations to download from and a page with a list of patches that are required so final preparations now so what was going to happen here is this temporary file uh, temporary um, Linux from scratch system gets installed into a location called tools a directory a subdirectory called tools so we're going to create that here now and we make a link to that directory onto the root so that it's accessible from the root and the reason that's done is because when we troot it's how do you describe it uh, it's the when we're installing packages we install them to tools on the root but when we troot into the real Linux from scratch environment that root won't be available anymore it'll be um, sorry the, the, the forward slash tools will be let me get this right otherwise it won't make sense when when we're building in the current um, uh, chapter five, which is the construction part, the temporary Linux from scratch, all the um, installations get put into two tools, um, tools as a, as a prefix where they get stored. Um, but that obviously won't exist when we're in the troot. And that's why we've got the uh, sim link to the root because they'll only exist at the root. The tools directory won't exist. So we install them to the tools. It makes them available at the root via the sim link because the root is all that will be available in the uh, true tomorrow when we're building in chapter six, i.e. the real Linux from scratch environment. I hope that makes sense. It's quite, quite mind bending, but... Uh, it will make sense perhaps when we install the first package if I show you at the moment we've got this sim link of tools into MNT LFS tools and we'll be installing into forward slash tools yes because that's what will be available when we're in, in Troot this because the new Troot will be MNT LFS and so that will be the root in tools that's that's why we're doing this uh, this paragraph here probably makes uh, that makes a better description of what I've just tried to describe so now we're going to create an LFS user and this is purely for the temporary file system so we had a LFS group and this is just so that we avoid corrupting the host system the, the the Debian system 
we don't want to trash that or install stuff into that. So by making us a, a normal user, it, it helps ensure that we don't make any mistakes and, and corrupt stuff. And as with all these commands, there's descriptions about what the switches do and so on. So let's create a password for this user. A simple password. And then we give ownership of the tools directory to the LFS user because we're going to build the temporary tools as the LFS user and also to the sources directory as well. It's just double checking that it has changed the ownership of the correct directory here, which it has. And now we become the LFS user. And again, you see on Gen 2, because we're an ordinary user, it goes to green the prompt, just a reminder that we're now a, a, an ordinary user without any special privileges. So now we've got to set up the environment for the LFS user. So we create this bash profile file, which sets some environment variables, and also the bash RC file, which sets up some other environment variables for the system. And lastly, when we source this bash profile, it will load both of these and activate um, uh, both of these files. Actually, what I'm going to do is just modify that bash profile. All oh, right, okay, we haven't got via at the moment. So I'm going to do it from outside. Um, so I need to go to the home directory of the Linux from scratch user, which will be back here on Gen 2. So CD home, CD LFS. And I want to modify the bash profile, yeah. Because what I want to do is Just put in a truth reminder here as well to remind. Oh. So, just want to put truth here to remind me that I'm inside a truthed environment. So now I can go back to the truth environment do the source bash profile, it hasn't worked, why is that? Let's come out and do su minus LFS. Okay. Oh right, okay, this is because this is the yeah, this this is an as exact command, so this needs to be run while we're at as the uh truth user. So if I put that in there like that and then copy the rest of it, that should that should work. No, it hasn't worked. Okay. So let's modify the other one. The bash RC. Um, I'll put it in here. one to keep the current one. Let's see if that works. Log out. 
Yeah, that's better. Yeah, in fact, I'll just put space after it. Okay, that's better. If I do this, yeah, it's retained it, so that's okay. Right, so static bash units, I think, what do they call them? That's still standard build units, they call them. They need to be called static bash units because bash used to be the first package that was built. It's basically saying if you time the first package, how long it builds, all the other packages have got a, an SBU rating and it's like a multiple of how long the first package took. It's not very reliable. I get the impression that some of the timings are with the tests and some are without, so it's only use it as a very rough guide, not a um, a very exact guide at all. Uh, yeah, this is make flags options for running things in parallel. So if you've got a multi-core system, which most most machines, if not all machines, in the last five ten years have got set this parameter to the number of cores you've got available. So I'm going to actually set that in the bash RC as well. So it's available to the LFS user. Um, and this machine's got four cores, so I'll just change that to uh, four. Now I never used to like doing this because there were some packages that were a bit temperamental with multi-core, but last several years or so the packages seem to have been quite more reliable and the um, editors of the LFS book have actually started making notes in the book of which packages don't like being run in, run in parallel. So I would say it's quite a reliable thing to do now and just take heed um, of any warnings in the book where it says to run the make with a J1, i.e. forcing it to use one thread or one core um, because you, you will have problems if you, if you do try to run it on multiple cores where they've taken note of that. Um, as I say, that was a bit of a lottery before because you weren't sure unless you'd made a note of it which packages would build successfully. Some would build successfully but wouldn't pass the tests successfully. So, um, yeah, I'm quite confident about the using multiple, multiple cores now. So, at the moment, we haven't got that variable uh, make flags. Oh, what have I done there? Echo, that should be. But if we source the profile, there it is there now. So I'm just going to log out, log back in again, because I'm not sure if I did anything. Yeah, that's okay. So it says about test suites, not really bothered about running test suites in the temporary system because it's reliant on the quite a bit on the host system uh, and some of the test packages aren't available either so we won't be running tests at all uh, but we will be running them in the final system because basically you want to make sure you've got a system that's reliable so you do want to do the tests in the in the uh, real system, but not in this chapter 5 part. So, uh, just make sure we've got the LFS uh, environment variable set, and it is. Two important boxes, I'd, I'd read them just to make sure that you understand what's going on, because it does help um, going through the packages, but basically if you follow what I do, as I said before, you, you, you can't go wrong. 